Uh, and thank you for reminding me to record the meeting. Uh, I see that on the screen. Um, what, I, what I found is everybody thinks that the grass is always greener, that, well, if I only work for corporate America, then Fortune 500 company, then everything would be fine because. And then somebody says, well, if I only work for the federal government, it'd be fine because. Or if I only worked in higher education, everything would be good because. And then when you find out when you actually work there, you find out there's always pros and cons of kind of every organization. So, so we're just going to talk about about that. And as usual, you can chat in questions. Um, uh, Bridget will. Um, I'll leave it up to her if she wants to answer them as she goes along, or she's going to um, wait till the end, or or what have you. But you know, again, Bridget's worked in you know like Marriott, um, Black and Decker, federal government. She's been an independent, a successful independent consultant, which, again, I've said this all the time. That's hard to do, in, in my opinion, and she's, she's done that for, for a number of years. So she's seen things from a lot of different perspectives. So with that, Bridget, I'm going to uh, make you the presenter and give you control of the screen, and it's all yours. Right, great. Well, thank you, Greg, for that very nice introduction. I'm not um, not sure that I deserve all of that, <laughs> but I appreciate it all the same. And um, before I move along here, can everyone see my screen? Yes. A little presentation there? Okay, very good. And the other thing I just want to say before um, moving on, um, well, two things. I'm not the best person in the world at seeing the chat. so. Maybe Greg, you can keep me honest. Okay. See some burning questions. Um, sure. You know, please interrupt me because I, I really want this to be an interactive discussion, and I'm I'm happy to kind of stop and, and address questions and have a discussion here and there. Um, the other thing, I want to apologize to everybody in advance about some of my text-heavy slides. Um, this is something that I combat in my daily work all the time. I work. Uh, I'm, I'm a contractor at the moment, and I also work for the federal government full time. So it's a, a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> I really don't love slides with a lot of text, but I was trying to cram as much information as I could in for you guys just so you get a good flavor of what we're talking about. All right? So um, moving on, um, Greg did a really beautiful sort of intro for me, but just to recap, and I'll make this really brief, you know, I've been in the, the training development arena for more than 16 years now. Um, I've been in pretty much every end of the spectrum. So I've been in design, development, delivery, um, and spent a lot of time measuring training, um, designing blended solutions, etc. cetera. Um, I have nine years of management experience across training functions. Um, and I've been creating media for a very long time. Um, media is kind of my one of my first loves. And um, I, I have been doing it uh, since the, the way back the way back Apple day is when the, my computer was basically a box. Um, but I also have, as Greg mentioned, a lot of experience working in many, many different types of, of organizations, um, from manufacturing to higher ed, um, consumer power tools, banking regulation. Um, so I've been really fortunate. Um, I've also gone out of my way to have a lot of different types of experiences. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to break new ground and learn a lot. So um, a lot of that has been by design. And just to put a nice sort of bow on it for you so you have a little more background, Greg's right, I got my uh, my master's uh, in instructional systems development at UMBC, but I also um, got a master of fine arts in imaging and digital arts there. And if you're ever looking to have multiple master's degrees, <laughs> I'm not sure who else really wants to do that. Um, but I would recommend imaging and digital arts all day long. It is a perfect fit for instructional systems development, especially if you want to go into learning technologies. So, um, and undergraduate work, I didn't really say much, but I went to Pitt College, and I have a, a um, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology with a um, minor in human development. So hopefully um, that paints a nice picture for you there. And the next thing I want to talk about, um, just briefly, I just want to give you kind of an overview of the types of organizations that I've worked for, and let me be more specific, types of training organizations. So 
I've been, again, really fortunate not just working in a lot of different industries, but also to work for a lot of different types of training organizations. So I've worked with um, numerous human resources, talent management, and organizational development units. Um, I've also been really fortunate, I think this is, has been very meaningful to my career, um, I've worked for a number of sales training organizations, and I can speak to why I, I think that's so meaningful a little later on. Um, I've worked for customer education units, um, not to be confused with consumer education units, which I'll mention also. Um, business line specific training organizations, executive leadership training teams, corporate universities, compliance training functions, IT training units, um, I mentioned um, consumer ed, and then of course, um, since I went to school for so long, <laughs> I've worked for a number of college and university training organizations as well. So, um, just to, to pull it all back, um, when I first talked to Greg about presenting um, to you guys tonight, he asked me very specifically to talk about sort of the management of training functions and structure and, and, you know, really also what that means to people in those types of organizations. So that's, that's what I'm planning on doing this evening. And I just want to, um, want to take you through my process in terms of how I've organized this information for you. Um, I think you'll find that when you look at training organizations, you'll, you'll start to see patterns for how training management is structured. Um, and it tends to be very much based on the size of the organization, which makes sense, right? You know, training is all about people and performance. So one thing that I've noticed is the more employees an organization has, the more training functions it has. Um, also, the more consistently an organization drives for bottom line profits and goal achievement, the more likely they are to focus on performance development as opposed to straight up process or product development. So, here again, I think this is very intuitive if you just stand back from it for a little bit. The bigger the bigger a business is, um, the bigger their training needs going to be, right? Because their business tends to be a little more complex, which means um, you have more training needs. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. I'm going to like pretend that I've seen virtual, virtual head nods. <laughs> All right, so with that in mind, um, Let's kind of dive in. Um, for the purposes of our discussion tonight, we'll talk about management of the training function or functions of an organization within the context of organizational size. So I think, again, that makes a lot of sense. So very specifically, we'll talk about small organizations, which are defined in, in gang. I'm using the Census Bureau definitions here as well as SBA. Um, that we're talking about one to 500 employees, which might not seem small, but somehow it is. <laughs> and then medium organizations, which um, again, for our purposes, are going to be 100, 501 to 5,000 employees. And then large organizations, which we'll define here as 5,001 employees to 10,000 employees. And then I also want to talk about national and international enterprises, which um, we'll say are 10,000 employees and above. Now, if time permits, um, and I save time permits, and I'm really hoping it does. We'll also talk about nonprofits and public sector organizations, which include federal, state, and higher education um, organizations. Okay? So before I move on, again, um, anybody has uh, a question, please just, again, um, throw it out there in the chat. And Greg's going to keep me honest and stop me if I just keep rolling along. <laughs> okay, and we'll start off with small organizations. So let me move on here. And before I get started, um, let me just break down for you how I'm going to approach this. I want to take a look at where training functions are housed within a small, within all these organizations, really. But you know, starting off with small, I want to look at where where the training function is sort of housed within the business, the typical size of the training organization, what the content looks like, delivery methods. Um, I also want to touch very briefly on performance, and I want to talk about budget, as well as sort of the characteristics of the organization. 
And then once we get through that, I do want to take a look again at um, what the pros and cons are of the structure for the people in the training organization. Okay? So, for small organizations, the typical manage management location tends to be human resources. And if you think about this for a second, that really makes sense. Um, generally, these are smaller businesses, so human resources tends to sort of be getting the ball going with onboarding people, taking care of their benefits, etc. So this tends to happen kind of organically, right? In terms of the size of a training organization for a small business, um, you know, there are lots of places where it's one guy, right? <laughs> but if I had to um, sort of define sort of the typical size for a smaller organization, I'd say it's three to 15 employees. 15 is a lot, um, but there are some small businesses that are, are very, you know, focused on development. Typically, though, they tend to be small. Um, and sort of basic players that I've seen, if it's on the very lean end, you're talking about a manager, a trainer, and a coordinator. Okay? Now, in terms of typical training content areas, of course we have, you know, onboarding things, etc. But also, um, you know, for a training unit within a small organization, they're generally focused on product and process knowledge, on you know compliance if it applies to their business, and sometimes sales. Um, really, these organizations are really very, very focused on making sure that folks have information that they need to do their job. They're pretty functional. Okay. In terms of typical training delivery methods, oftentimes what you're going to see with a small organization um, is ILT, a lot of coaching, mentoring, job aids, searchable document sites. You're really looking at an organization that, again, is trying to do that um, very specific delivery of information that folks need to get their job done. A lot of times, in terms of coaching and mentoring, that tends to happen a little more organically. Um, delivery methods are not often as formalized as they are in bigger organizations, but that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. In terms of measurement, oftentimes small um, training organizations within a small function, small business, they tend to kind of stop at level two, and there's there are a couple reasons for that. So for Patrick's level one, you know, satisfaction, Everybody wants to measure how satisfied people were with the training. Um, and these days, that's a lot easier to do than it used to be, that's for sure. Um, level two, some small businesses are better about this than others, but that tends to be kind of the range for the most part. If you think about level three, if you look at transfer of learning, that's something that tends to be more of a mid and um, larger business um, priority, and often it's because they're not quite as lean and the business is more mature, so they have, you know, the opportunity and time behind them to really be thinking about what transfer of learning looks like, what performance looks like. So that's why you tend to see sort of this difference in measurement of training. Now, with regard to budget, which is one of my favorite topics for training organizations, you know, typically with small organizations, um, the funding tends to come out of the human resources budget or the overall business operations budget. Um, this tends to be a very decided line item, so budgets um, don't fluctuate a lot for small training organizations and, um, and small businesses. And it's, it's um, not surprising, right? So smaller businesses, if they want to be big businesses, they have to be conservative. Um, and a lot of times what that means is focusing on what you need to focus from a delivery perspective and then um, getting a little more creative about coaching and mentoring, etc. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Now in terms of characteristics of um, a small organization training unit. So as I've said, they tend to be very lean and mean. Uh, they tend to be very focused on getting information to employees that are going to help them do their job. They tend to grow organically, and they're often comprised of um, functional subject matter experts rather than training and development professionals. Um, technologies for these organizations tend to be on the low side. And while 
Um, such organizations may contract out with vendors for off-the-shelf solutions. Few are really contracting with designers and development pros to come on in and supplement the business. Again, this has to do with, um, I think, maturity of businesses and, again, that budget that we talked about. Okay? So apologize for all the text on your screen. Um, just wanted to make sure that I was covering all the bases for you, giving you a really nice flavor of what this, how these functions look and how they're structured. So before I move on, any questions there? Okay. Um, so let's take a look now at what, what the pros and cons are of um, a small business function for the people that are in it. And I'm going to apologize. Before I move on, this screen, as much as I wanted to animate it for you, couldn't really do it in a timely fashion. So you've got a lot of stuff on your screen. But um, just to walk you through it. So if you're a training manager in a small organization, generally you have a lot of latitude. Um, there tends to be a lot of support from the organization, lots of room to grow. And quite often, you're the hero, right? Because you are trying to solve problems, create solutions that are going to help the business grow and that are going to make things better. You know, one of the cons, uh, a couple cons if you're a training manager, first of all, your, your resources are generally limited. And again, it goes back to that budget that we talked about. So designing adequate training solutions can be difficult. Um, it can be difficult also if you are a person who might be a subject matter expert or a, a high-performing business professional professional, but not someone with a training development background. It can definitely be frustrating to someone who's in a training manager role in a small organization. And mainly that's because you are a working manager in this kind of role. You're not somebody that stands back and says, you know, let me let me find the best outside source to get this thing going, right? You need to be someone who can get the ground running. In terms of instructional designers, um, I'm not going to say that no small businesses have instructional designers, but very often in a smaller organization, they don't have them. And um, in cases where, where they are sort of prioritizing instructional design or they're aware of instructional design as a discipline, um, they often are contracting out for it. But that doesn't happen for businesses this size that much easier either, in my experience. And, you know, you guys might have different experiences, and I'd love to hear about it, but that's been my, my general experience. And in terms of developers, here again, um, smaller organizations don't tend to have them. Um, what they do have are trainers often. Now, these are folks that are highly valued by the organization. Um, as a trainer in a small organization, you tend to get a lot of recognition. Again, it's a small place. People know you. A lot of times everybody comes in and is onboarded by the same trainer. Um, they get to be really effective because they're very hands-on. So those are some pros of being a trainer. Um, some cons of being a trainer in a small organization. Um, you, are, you are generally tasked with being the designer and the developer, and you might not often have a background. Um, you might have a passion for people and for development, but might not know how to start, and you might spin your wheels a lot. So that can that can be the downside there. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting. Um, one day, maybe Greg will ask me to talk about trainers because I think that's uh, kind of kind of an amazing, uh, and interesting um, group of folks within our profession to to really examine. Now, project managers, um, again, small organizations, they don't tend to have project managers that are focused very specifically on training and development. What they do often have are coordinators. Um, and coordinators generally are responsible for you know, setting up face-to-face -face training, um, working with human resources on onboarding, um, et cetera. So I think you guys probably understand that role kind of intuitively. Something um, that's very beneficial um, or pros for a training coordinator in this type of a structure, there's a lot of room to grow, right? And there's a lot of room to learn about performance demands. Um, you get a lot of visibility, much like a trainer. You're often a person's first contact 
with a company before they walk in the door. So um, it's kind of a good job to have in that regard. Um, there's also oftentimes kind of a long leash for solving problems. So um, if you're trying to deliver a web conference, nobody's done it before, you're the training coordinator and you raise your hand, often your manager is going to say, figure it out, go do it. <laughs> so that's one of the benefits of the structure, you know, especially if you're in that role. Now in terms of cons for training coordinator in this situation, there tends to be a lot of work. Um, and again, I think probably intuitively that's something that you, you can suss out, right? Um, they're generally the one person who's in charge of, you know, following around all their new employees, kind of like, you know, little ducklings, <laughs> making sure that everybody has what they need to come to training, to start with the organization, um, et cetera. So it can be a lot, you know, on top of paperwork and, you know, just very task-oriented things. And on top of that, I've been in situations with many training coordinators that also have full-time jobs as, you know, administrative assistants. So it can be a lot. So any questions about small business, small organization training function structure? How's my pace? Am I going okay for you guys? No, you're doing good. Hey, I, I have an alley. This is Allie. I, I have a question. It's not really a question, except um, I work for an organization that started out as a small organization, and okay. it's gotten much bigger, but it still <laughs> thinks it's small. Right. Is that, t is that typical? <laughs> that is very typical. And, um, you know, as we move on to sort of like mid-size um, organizations, I think that they're kind of one of the most exciting places to work because oftentimes you do have that legacy sort of tension, if you will, you know, trying to trying to keep that small focus and, and that lean sort of work structure, and it doesn't always work. But um, it can also be exciting because it leads to a lot of change. So, right, thanks. Makes sense? Okay. Right. All right. So, moving on, slides and stuff, bear with me, to medium-sized organizations. So, here we're talking about, you know, 501 to 5,000 employees. Um, I think the 501 is kind of funny, guys. Right? just <laughs> private laugh for Bridget there. Um, in terms of what these organizations uh, look like, where the training management function tends to be located. Here, um, it also tends to be in either human resources or a strategic business line. So Alice, it's Allie, right? Or was it Alice? Right. I'm sorry. So it's in, Alice, but everybody calls me Allie. Allie's okay. Name. Very cool. So in your organization, as it's growing, um, when you do get to sort of that mid-size, you know, oftentimes part of the, there's a part of an organization that will start to drive the business. So whether it's sales or manufacturing or IT or whatever it might be, oftentimes um, kind of a new player emerges and they tend to sort of take control over driving performance. Um, so a very, very typical situation that I see over and over again is sort of human resources in a mid-sized organization sort of having responsibility for onboarding and then a strategic business line having responsibility for ongoing performance. Or sometimes, this doesn't happen as much in, in medium-sized organizations, but sometimes you can have multiple business lines that are, are driving performance and training for themselves. But again, it tends to be, just from a budgetary perspective, you either have one or two, and oftentimes one of them tends to have a little more budget, a little more power than the other. Now, in terms of typical size for training organizations, um, mid-sized training organizations, I think here you're talking about 5 to 15, a very common team that you see um, for these types of organizations. You have a manager, um, generally a developer, uh, and a, tra a trainer, oftentimes a coordinator. Coordinators hang around. Um, they're, they're essential to every organization, but you'll see sort of the shift as we talk about um, large and national and international 
organizations as well. In terms of content areas, um, as I just mentioned, what typically happens with medium-sized organizations, you do start to see onboarding, which is important. And you know, when organizations grow, they get to a, a point where they're just they're bringing on new people, and it's cumbersome. It takes a lot of time to stop and onboard, you know, individual people. So you often see this push towards streamlining and automating that effort. Um, the product and process knowledge continues, compliance if it's applicable, sales if it's applicable, and then you start seeing this very specific business line soft skills type of training. So um, for example, in a sales organization, um, or let's take sales out of it, let's say um, you have um, IT sort of driving, driving the bus, you might start to see soft skills training that is um, very specific around the IT discovery process, um, around listening, around um, structured analysis, those types of things. So again, you've got, you know, oftentimes this one big driver within a business, and that's where you start to see really specific training. In terms of um, delivery methods, this just gets bigger as we go along, guys. So here again, you see ILT training, uh, coaching, mentoring, job aids. Here I'm going to say you start to see some e-learning because when you start talking about business line specific training, folks want to have training that's very specific to their, their folks and driving performance there. So e-learning kind of, um, it, it seems to happen very naturally for medium-sized organizations. Um, you also start to see internet resources as opposed to, and when I say that, what I'm talking about are, you know, place within a company internet um, where you can find manuals or templates or job aids as opposed to, you know, multiple folders on an external drive somewhere or something or a, a shared drive. So you start to see this push towards um, making things a little easier and self-directed training. Now, um, no surprise here with regard to typical measures of performance. Uh, I kind of gave you the, the heads up on the last when we talked about small organizations. For medium-sized organizations, you do start to see the move from um, stopping it at Kirkpatrick level two to level three. These are organizations that are starting to really define what performance looks like. And it's easier to make that transition. And of course, you want to measure these things. Now, Level three is hard for lots and lots of organizations for lots of reasons. And I think one of the primary reasons is um, measuring level three doesn't always mean, you know, giving somebody an assessment or asking them to do a case study or whatever. It might actually just be whether or not they performed a certain task and did it correctly. So this is sometimes hard for folks to think about what that measurement needs to be. But when you see the introduction, it tends to be here in the medium size organization. Now budget, um, this is interesting. So considering the location for these types of training organizations, um, oftentimes the funding is coming out of an overall business operations budget as opposed to uh, human resources in, a, in another line. So at this point for a medium sized organization, leadership has started to really think about it in terms of being strategic, right? So generally, the line item or the budget or the um, financial analysis starts to happen in operations. In terms of what these organizations tend to look like, um, as I've said, they tend to be growing or sometimes transitioning. Um, they're generally much more focused on training for performance. Um, they also have team members that are focused on creating training materials. Um, so what you're going to see, um, as I mentioned above, you, you've got that developer role in there, um, which you didn't see with the small, the small organization quite as much. You saw a trainer who had responsibility for, for everything, right? Now, in terms of learning technologies, um, here you start to see learning management. You start to see offering tools. So um, again, as, as an organization grows, as they have more people, um, there are lots of reasons why you need to 
move in the direction of being able to track uh, their performance. Um, and it's not just about training, it's about, you know, employee management. Um, sometimes, I haven't seen this quite as much for medium-sized organizations, but sometimes you also see performance management systems. Um, that tends to be a slightly larger organization um, platform. That's a big investment. So um, that's typically what you're looking at, looking at. And in terms of vendors, these organizations, um, they often contract with professional instructional designers. This is where you see that reach out where organizations say, you know what, we really need very specialized training. We really don't know how to do this. We want it to be interactive and measurable. Let's get some professionals in the door. Um, you also see at this point that reach out for vendors who do customized training solutions. So the learning management systems, um, the hosted authoring tools, etc. Okay. So let me move on now, and I'm going to, you know, one more time apologize for all the text on the screen. But in terms of pros and cons for medium organizations, for a training manager, here again, just as we saw before, there's a lot of responsibility. Um, there tends to be a lot of support from leadership to drive the business through strategic training efforts, um, which is, if you think about it for a second, good for your career if you're a training manager. You're directly aligned with leadership. Um, that's a high visible role, and it's a good thing. In terms of cons, um, money's coming out of operational budget, as I just mentioned, right? So as you're, if you're a training manager and you're, you're watching this thing grow, the business is getting bigger or it might be transitioning, you're probably going to see the need for new resources. And it is often very difficult for training managers in these kind of uh, situations to justify needing new resources. Um, and it's just because oftentimes leadership is not really familiar with what a certain type of, of resource is going to give you. Um, my experience has been that, um, and it's not just in medium-sized companies, but most leadership uh, executive level folks really don't know what instructional <laughs> design is. They're very focused on deliverables. A lot of organizations are very focused on um, performance, which is great, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, but in terms of how you get there to having high-performing technologies and, and high-quality training, that's often a miss for folks. So um, the other con for a training manager here is that oftentimes a team solution will outpace the organization's delivery method. And what I mean by that is in this type of an organization, remember, we're driving and driving to get better. We're driving to create higher quality training, um, to, to streamline and automate our efforts so we can deliver the best training possible. And sometimes your team might design something that um, you just don't have the technology to support. And that happens a lot with medium-sized organizations. Now, for instructional designers, I mentioned before, these types of organizations, they don't often have instructional designers, per se. What they do have are developers. Um, so developers in this situation are expected to be sort of the, the designer developer um, the, the person who does everything from a deliverable perspective. And that can be good and it can be bad, just as I have it sort of listed here. On the pro side, there's lots of, lots of room to grow, lots of room to learn new skills, to refine skills that you have, and lots of opportunity for innovation. If you're the developer, um, you know, and you, you want to sort of pursue Moodle or, you know, creating your own LMS, et cetera, Oftentimes in these kind of organizations, the business itself is, is being innovative or trying to grow, which kind of trickles down to training. So it's a good place to be if you're somebody in the development role. However, um, as I just said, you often tend to be the person that does everything. Um, and you often don't have the time to sit down and really learn something thoroughly if you are wildly interested in, you know, Adobe Connect or um, certain types of programming, the learning is going to be on your own time. So that just, it's part and parcel of this type of organization. Now for trainers, um, here again, this is a highly visible, um, a valued role within the organization. Um, 
you get a lot of recognition in small businesses, um, you can be very effective because you're very hands-on. However, on the con side, um, trainers in these organizations, they're often tasked with forming strategic partnerships with key business lines, but they still have this, this day job, right? So they're still expected to be a subject matter expert. They're still expected to deliver training. So trainers in this type of an organization can also be really taxed. Um, it just seems to be part of the, you know, the nature of the beast, if you will. Project managers, mid-sized organizations often really don't have project managers that are devoted very specifically on training and development. But you still see that coordinator role. And for coordinators, um, here again, still lots of, lots of room to grow, lots to learn about in terms of performance. Um, you're still kind of in that role, seeing an organization grow. That can be very meaningful. You still have a lot of visibility. Um, and at this point, with this type of organization, when they're moving towards um, automating, for coordinators, there is an opportunity to get your hands on some learning technologies, which means you can, you can bump it up. You can, you know, maybe you're the person that, that moves into a developer role if you're so inclined. Maybe you're the person who can move into um, a trainer role if that's something that you're interested in. You just have um, a little more flexibility. And that, again, is one of the reasons why I think medium-sized organizations are so exciting. Um, when you're growing, when you're trying to innovate, lots of very cool things can happen. So, and, and they can happen for people in, in training organizations. So it, in many ways, is a, a very good place to be. But again, back to the coordinators, in terms of cons, um, not a lot has changed here in terms of there still being a lot of work for training coordinators. Um, and when you get to this point, a lot of that work, tends, it tends to be even more administrative than it was. This very odd thing happens when you go to automate training, design, and delivery. Um, you have a lot of documentation of what you're doing. Um, there's a lot of sort of tasky things involved with setting up new technologies, right? So it tends to, um, a lot of that work tends to trickle down to the training coordinator, and it, it can be uh, a little tedious. All right. So I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking before I move on. Any, any questions about medium-sized organizations? Nope. Bridget, this okay. is Greg. Well, this, is, oh. this is Allie. I'll say something again. I, oh, Greg, go ahead. No, Allie, go ahead. I'll wait. Well, I was just going to say about my organization, I, I find like in the beginning, a lot of the roles, people wear, the roles are kind of defined, but sometimes the same person is doing them. Mm -hmm. You know, so like somebody right. is playing the role of training manager for a while and then they're doing something else. They're actually designing and then they put on the hat where they're going and, you know, managing the project from the training point of view with the rest of the corporation, you know. It's right. kind of interesting. They, they separate out the tasks, but it might be that, you know, the same person that's doing a bunch of the different things. And in terms of the very first part of the slide where you talk about um, outpacing the, the solutions outpace, might outpace the, uh, the, the organization, I've noticed a lot that the education department in our company actually drives um, the innovations, actually pushes that, that, that envelope. We're like on the leading edge all the time asking for more of the new stuff. Right, right. Which is kind of cool. That is cool, and that is, again, one of the really great things about medium-sized organiza or organizations that have started to grow like yours, right? Because if, if you're in training and you've had this traction and you've, you've been able to drive performance in a certain way, you do get a lot of recognition from leadership, right? And you definitely have the ability for a certain amount of time to say, hey, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we were able to edit our own video, et cetera? So, that, um, that tends to be one of the great benefits of working for a training organization, a medium-sized company. And I agree also, something that, that happens a lot for these types of organizations, you do wind up wearing a lot of hats. You might have a role, you might be the training manager, you might be the trainer, um, but because you're growing and because you're innovating, a lot of times people are pitching in all over the place, right? Definitely for training managers and a medium-sized organization, you are functional. You're very functional, just like in the small organizations. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. 
um, you know, there are lots of training managers that do want to be sort of hands off and want to think very much about high level design and blend as opposed to rolling up their sleeves. And that does not fly in this environment. And I'm sure, Ali, you've seen that. <laughs> exactly. Great, great feedback. Greg, was there something that you wanted to say? Um, yeah, I was just interested in hearing your experience on, um, I'll, I don't have, it's more of a, a comment than a question. It's like, I have seen a number of, you know, talked to a number of people in our field, and there seems to be a level of frustration at times where people in training and learning get frustrated with their clients, their organization, not really understanding what training or learning or instructional design, et cetera, is. And I would just be interested to hear your comments on that um, because it, just, it seems to be a frustration on a number of people's parts. And to me, whether we like it or not, I think part of the job is we have to educate and inform those people is this is how training works and this is what instructional design is. and that sort of thing, and, and I think a number of people probably, they think they know what it is, the, the people like in the organization, but they usually don't in my experience, and right, I was just right. curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, something that, um, it, and that, you're absolutely right, that's something that you do run into over and over and over again, and when you get to a certain level in certain types of organizations, that, there are executives, there are, you know, leaders and companies that don't even want to hear. They're, they don't really care at all. But something that leadership and executives care about sort of across the board in every business I've ever worked in is performance. They do care very much about people achieving goals. And that's one way to sort of pull back the, the conversation, right? So. You know, if, if you're talk, if if you want to sort of get somebody on board with why you might need instructional design resources or what the value is to the organization, you know, my tact is often to paint a picture for them in terms of here's where your folks are today, here's how they're performing today, here's how you want them to perform, and you've got this gap in the middle, and this is how a very structured, well thought out, tailored design can get you there. And then you start to see sort of light bulbs going on. So um, my, my advice is always, you know, make it, when you want to have a conversation like that, make it specific to your audience and your audience's needs and expectations and goals. And I have found, again, over and over again for leadership, performance of employees is a key goal. Does that answer your question, Greg, or does that help? Yeah, because I, I, I think you're right about the performance that every good manager or leader should be concerned about that. And it's just like, you know, I've yet to find an organization that doesn't want to, uh, you know, they everybody wants to increase their sales or increase their resources. And then on the other end, they want to be more efficient and more um, uh, conservation minded with, with their, their resources. So you know, that again, that's like a universal thing like you were saying about performance. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense what you said. Right. Thank you. And you will find also that organizations that are very that are performance based, so sales organizations, service organizations, um, they tend to get this very intuitively. And for those organizations, oftentimes you've got design overload, <laughs> where some things are being very elaborately designed that maybe don't necessarily have to be. Um, but that's, you know, in our line of work, that's a much better place to be, obviously. But I think if you think about it, um, it, it makes sense. So you look at um, the amount of time and effort that sales organizations put into, especially live training, you know, they're very convinced that um, you know, there's something magical in the sales process that, that you really need to have a trainer sort of imparting that wisdom, et cetera. So um, I, th I think you definitely see a little more patience and openness and understanding about what an instructional design process can bring to those kind of organizations. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. 
Bridget, this is the Jay Shree. Um, just to, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Just to add to your point, um, uh, that's a very valid point you made when you said that uh, in your explanation <clears throat> to the stakeholders, it's important to, um, uh, you know, align your explanation and uh, description of uh, training and instructional design with their goals and expectations. Because in most cases, like uh, as Greg pointed out, <clears throat> uh, there are there are situations where people. Uh, have their own version of training, their own ideas of training, and just to break through that uh, can sometimes be a challenge. That is that is very true, very very true. And we've all kind of been there, right? Yeah, we have, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes that is not pretty, right? And um, yeah. you can have a good conversation though if you've got, um, you know, even though the training might not be. What we would all like to see, you can often, you know, bring it back and talk about how it could be something else or how it could be vastly improved just by thinking about what the performance goals are and align that back with good design practices. That's true. Wonderful feedback, my friend. <laughs> all right. So are we ready to move on to large organizations? Yes. You got are you, are you getting sick of hearing me talk at this point? I hope not. I hope not. All right, so let's move on. Large organizations. So here, guys, we're talking about um, 5,001 to 10,000 employees. Um, I've done lots and lots of work with large organizations. So um, I have a lot to say about this. I'll try and be as succinct as possible. In terms of... Um, Typical management location for training in a large organization, it tends to be um, in more than one place. Um, you often have a human resources unit. You tend to have strategic business lines. Um, and often something that you will see in a large organization is IT-specific training. And there are reasons why that happens, too. Um, it, it makes sense if you think about how companies develop and grow and mature, and we'll talk about that in a second. Typical size of training organizations, so here, you know, as, as we talked about the management, you're going to have multiple organizations within a large business often. So usually you've got two to three to, you know, I've seen as many as six different training organizations in a large business. Um, oftentimes they have eight to 20 employees each, and that's, that's a lot of people aligned around training. Typical content areas. Here you're going to see um, you're going to see a little bit of growth, right? So you have your onboarding training that we talked about before, product and process knowledge, compliance training again if it applies, um, sales, business line specific soft skills. But then you start to see in these bigger organizations um, culture training on the company's culture, essential business skills across the organization. So when you're talking about a very large business. Oftentimes, there's a much bigger business identity. Um, there might be very specific brand identities. Um, they might function very specifically within a larger industry. And so that's why you start to see these types of training and content areas as well. In terms of delivery methods, you start to kind of see it all, right? So we have ILT, coaching, mentoring, you know, job aids, e-learning, internet resources, proprietary networking systems. Uh, mobile training, and something that I didn't mention here that I probably should have is also performance support. Um, and that kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that IT is in the mix at this point. In terms of typical measures of performance, when you get to a really big organization, um, not that small and medium-sized businesses are focused on their dollars and their budgets and what they're putting into training, but large organizations are at a point where if you do have, you know, three to six organizations internally that are focused on training, they want to they know what the return on the investment is. Now, a lot of organizations really struggle with that measurement for a lot of reasons, and a lot of, I'm not going to lie to you, I've been involved in, in um, trying to design measurements for companies where they really wanted to sort of fudge what that measurement looks like. It just... It, it happens. It takes a lot of discipline to sort of pull that back as well. But you do see 
lots and lots of interest and understanding the return on the investment. In terms of budget arrangements, um, considering all these different organizations that are involved, um, here you, you start to see funding for training coming very specifically out of a business lines budget. So you have training coming out of the human resource budget, out of a sales budget, out of IT, etc. They are line items. Um, they're controlled very specifically by that organization. In terms of what these organizations look like, what the training organization um, tends to, how they tend to function, these organizations often tend to be very well established. They tend to be very focused on training for performance. And um, they tend to be quite strategic. They're often composed of instruction designers, developers, project managers, uh, training coordinators. Um, sometimes they're dedicated subject matter experts. So they tend to be a lot more robust. Learning technologies for these organizations tend to be quite sophisticated. Um, you do see learning and performance management systems in place, as well as um, media generation, editing tools. These organizations often, very often, contract with design houses um, who can do sort of nuts to soup to nuts solutions for them. Um, you see them contacting with industry specific vendors and also with um, providers of off the shelf solutions. So um, they're big, they're complex, and they're trying to cover all their bases. In terms of pros and cons, You'll notice that my table just got bigger. <laughs> It'll be bigger for, um, for national and international uh, organizations as well. I apologize. Um, but there's a lot to say here, right? So for training managers in a, in a large organization, you tend to have more strategic responsibilities, right? You tend to be not quite as functional. You're often managing a budget. Um, you're usually directly aligned with key business leaders. Oftentimes, we're talking very specifically about executives. You tend to be aligned with key business functions. Um, your goals tend to be very specific and for a very specific audience. Performance, me performance measurements tend to be um, very narrowly defined. And as a manager in, in this type of an organization, you tend to be um, having an ongoing conversation about defining those measures as well. So the cons of being a training manager in a large organization, you're often competing for dollars with other training organizations and for controlling team resources. This happens, guys, because um, learning technologies tend to be shared. Enterprise projects tend to be shared. So even though you might have a very directed team and have very um, specific projects, you often have these shared efforts as well. Um, you also have the issue of meeting the needs, and I will move, I just noticed I've got this my panel over top of the slide, I apologize. Um, you often have difficulty sort of meeting the needs of your internal customers, especially if you, and I should say very specifically, if you have a lot of these shared projects as well. So you have to be very, um, very aligned with, with the project manager, very aligned with your team. You have to be um, extremely communicative as a training manager in this, this type of an organization because um, you don't want to miss your goals and you don't want to miss a delivery. So uh, a, a different type of role for a training manager, I think. In terms of instructional designers, here, th this is a type of an organization where you do start to see strategic um, hiring of instructional designers. Um, and in a bigger organization, if you're a designer, you often get work assignments that hit every level of the ADDI model, right? So you get to do training needs assessments. You get to um, write and sequence objectives. You do content outlines, storyboards. Uh, you might be developing here, too. A lot of organiza bigger organizations um, do look for instructional designers that can double as developers as well, right? You have a lot of exposure to very sophisticated learning technologies and performance technologies, which is a great thing for a career. Um, a lot of exposure to external design professionals, also great for your career, right? The more folks you can network with, the better. Um, and in a bigger organization, if you're a designer, you're going to meet a lot of people. In terms of cons, um, you can have limited growth potential within a given team. 
um, especially as you're sort of pigeonholed as a certain type of ID. So what I mean by that, you might, I mean, this has happened to me a time or two, you might be turned into the classroom designer, or you might be the performance support designer. So um, you do have to do a little bit of work to diversify and to, to keep diversifying and letting everyone know that you are diverse in your skill set. So that's a little bit of a con for um, being a designer in a larger organization. For developers, um, if you were hired very specifically to develop training for a large organization, you typically have access to some very advanced technologies. You have a lot of room to develop new skills and to grow to refine your skills. You have a lot of opportunity for innovation. A lot of large organizations want to bring in developers and create really cool stuff. A lot of times they don't have the back end infrastructure to know what to do with these people. So oftentimes if you're hired on as a developer, you get to kind of write the playbook in terms of what that process looks like. So um, that can be really good. It can be bad. Um, in, a, in a good situation, it's usually really good because you have a strong manager and a strong team. Now, um, as you can see in the con column there, I've noted that one of the problems is you can become the go-to media person for multiple teams, and they might not be training teams. Like, you know, it might be HR, it might be sales. The minute, you know, folks in an organization learn that you know how to um, crop their mother-in-law out of a picture or something, you know, you become a, a highly sought after person. So, you know, and, and I'm being facetious there, but we've all been there. We need somebody who can help you create something that is cool or that's going to make your presentation amazing, you know, whatever it might be, you tend to go back to those folks. So it's just something that can happen. All right. So for trainers in a large organization, here's, here's where we start to see a little bit of a shift. Bigger organizations, um, they start to move away from classroom. Um, so you, you see the role of the trainer changing a little bit. Um, in terms of pros, there's still a lot of organizational value on trainers as subject matter experts, right? They've been around the block. They know their content area inside out. Oftentimes, trainers travel a lot in large organizations. They're sent sort of strategically for events, etc. And if you're the kind of person that likes that, that can be great. There tends to be a lot of opportunity for collaborative work with other business lines. And, you know, as a trainer, you often get exposure to new technologies that you, you might not have any experience with. So the downside of all that, um, again, as I mentioned, when organizations start to start avoiding traditional classroom training, there's a lot of anxiety there for trainers, right? You think your job's going away. Um, and, and there can be some pain and agony in that process, right? Um, it, re, it reduces your value in the organization, and you really have to struggle to say, That's, I'm not just the classroom guy or gal. I'm the person who facilitates. And a lot of trainers um, that are super strong in the classroom, those skills oftentimes really do translate to a virtual environment. Sometimes they totally don't. And there are lots of trainers that, um, uh, there's no other way to put it other than to say are technology phobic and or they love sort of the, the rush, if you will, of the classroom. Met lots of these folks in my career. Um, and so this, this can be, you know, it's kind of like that movie, The Artist, you know. So you're moving to a, a sound medium. <laughs> Whereas it was silent, you know, it, it's kind of a, an appropriate analogy there, I think. Now, in terms of project managers, project managers are very highly sought after and very valued in large training organizations. When you think about the complexity of shared projects, etc., it's not surprising at all, all that you start to see this role as being very important in those types of organizations. So they tend to handle very complex projects and deliverables. Uh, they do work that requires them to become very, very familiar with training and development practices and theory. That's great for your career for a project manager. I think for those of you that are project managers, you know, the more disciplines that you become familiar with, the, the, the easier your job becomes because you can kind of see the future in terms of milestones and, 
resource problems that you might have, etc. It definitely you know opens the door for you in a lot of ways. Um, you often, as a project manager, also have control over budget. You're often the person who can see how many hours went into creating that storyboard. You know how many hours are left, etc. So um, here again, great for people in that role. Very good experience. The cons can be that um, when you're a really great project manager for a training organization, the rest of the organization sees it. And you can start to get that pile on. You can get um, projects sort of assigned to you that are, are sort of related on the periphery, but not really, and it takes away from your day-to-day -day work. Um, work within training and development can also be challenging for project managers who aren't used to the detailed requirements of instructional design. You know, a lot of project managers, especially those that are coming out of the IT world, are used to sort of um, milestone deliverable, milestone deliverable, bam, bam, bam. And you guys know, in our world, it's not a big deal at all to stop and have a 20-minute conversation about, well, what does it really mean to table a discussion? What are you really doing with the customer when you do that? How do you shelf the call, etc. So, you know, we need to know <laughs> if we're going to develop instruction. That's the type of, you know, information that we we dive deep in, and I've seen it many times, it, there's a level of maturity that project managers have to develop in terms of being able to just have the patience for that. We're, we're unique guys. It's, it, we, we, we pull those details apart. In terms of the training coordinator role, um, here again, pros, there's, there's still lots of room to grow, um, lots, lots to learn about performance demands, lots of opportunity to engage with new technologies. Um, and here you start to see the ability of training coordinators to start to engage in event planning. Um, this happens often when organizations are moving away from the classroom as sort of their primary delivery mechanism um, to more sort of strategic events, strategic training events, development events. Um, and if you're someone who kind of wants to stay in that realm, um, it's a little more administrative, less sort of development, design focus. You know, event planning is a skill, and this, you know, type of role can sort of really get you going in that direction. In terms of cons for someone in that, that uh, role, um, this work tends to be even more administrative in nature than it is in the other two, right? Um, there are a lot of specialties. Um, there are a lot of specialty team members, um, you don't have quite the same runway in terms of your personal development as you do in smaller organizations. In smaller organizations, you can be the guy that learns how to do everything and just moves on up the chain, right? So when you have an instructional designer, a developer, you know, trainers, etc., project managers sort of ahead of you, that becomes more difficult, right? So, I'm going to move on to the last organization that I have for you. And bear with me one second. My clicker's not working. National and international organizations. So we're talking about really big enterprises, guys. Um, 5,001 to 10,001 employees. I'm not sure why I had to just 10,001. I think that was supposed to be 10,000. <laughs> Um, so these are big, big organizations, right? Now, um, when I talk about a national and international organization, the ones that I can think of that I personally worked for, Marriott, Black & Decker, um, organizations like that that just have a global reach. Now, let's talk about where the location tends to be for training in these types of organizations. Much like large organizations, it tends to be um, in lots of places, right? So human resources often has their own functions, strategic business lines, um, sales, service, manufacturing, IT. You also start to see international branches of training, right? So European Union, Asia PAC, Americas, you see um, oftentimes organizations very specifically for those branches. In, in terms of typical size of a training organization um, that's uh, national or international, 
you again have multiple organizations. They usually tend to be um, a minimum of eight to 20 employees each. So here again, you can be talking about hundreds of employees, um, really, or 100 plus, dedicated specifically to training, uh, which is, is a lot of people. In terms of typical training content, this is where you just start to see the, the doors blow off, right? So onboarding, product and process knowledge, clients, if it applies, sales, business lines, specific soft skills, organizational culture, essential bi um, business skills. Um, here you start to see international economics or business law, international law, um, things that are very specific to operating in a global marketplace. Typical training delivery methods. Uh, here again, when you have um, a business that's, that's located all over the world, if you will, you see everything. IoT, coaching, mentoring, job aids, e-learning, internet resources, uh, proprietary network um, sites, uh, mobile learning, self-directed development, and again, of course, performance support. Typical measures, much like a large organization, national and international training organizations, they want to measure everything. They want to see satisfaction, learning transfer, and return on investment. Typical budget arrangements. Um, funding generally comes out of specific business line and branch budgets, much like it does in a large organization. And in terms of how these organizations look, characteristics of them, they often tend to be very well established, diverse, very focused on training for performance. Um, they tend to be very highly strategic. They're often composed of instructional designers, developers, project managers, trainers, coordinators, sometimes dedicated subject matter experts, and sometimes even dedicated executives. Um, learning technologies for these organizations tend to be quite sophisticated. So you often see learning and performance management systems in place, media generation, editing tools, authoring tools, etc. And these types of organizations are often contracting out with um, design houses industry-specific vendors, translation companies, and other sophisticated um, technologies companies. Okay? And I have to beg your pardon for one second. I'm going to grab a sip of water. <laughs> one, one moment, please. You're allowed, Sorry. Bridget. Talking lady here. Um, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. I mean, we all know I can talk, but... <laughs> yeah, as you're... As you're maybe, you know, having your drink, I just had something that I, I see quite a bit, and I'm, again, just wondering what, what your thoughts are on this. There are, you know, some people that, that are in our field that are just starting to get involved in the field, and they don't really have a lot of experience yet, and occasionally some people will talk to me, or I'll, you know, just learn about situations where they think they're going to be, like, an instructional designer forever, and right. they think they're going to progress in their company. And what I try to tell them, this year, your, your position, is that a lot of companies, they don't want to pay you, uh, you know, $100,000 right now to be an instructional designer. You'll have to probably take on project management responsibilities, do other things. And that's, you know, not untypical in a way compared to a lot of different jobs. You know, it's kind of the same. You're not going to be like a manufacturing specialist. You might be like, you know, a supervisor of people that are working on a manufacturing line and then go up to manufacturing manager, things like that. But I found that some people have a hard time either understanding that or they just don't want to recognize the reality of that, at least, at least in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that is a, a really astute observation. I think as, as we've you know, looked at all these different types of organizations, you can kind of see where the runway is and where it isn't. But I can kind of see it because I've been doing it a while and I've had exposure to a lot of different types of organizations. Sometimes it's kind of hard to, to recognize where, where an organization's value is on training, but also on certain types of positions, right? So when you look at you know, for example, these national and international companies, they've got a product line or a service or whatever it might be, and the entire organization really functions around that, right? So it's, um, 
it's very different. You have in an organization like this that we're you know we're looking at right here, you probably do have the opportunity to be an instructional designer for a lot of different teams, right? So if you start out in sales, you might be able to go to IT um, if you want to be a designer. If you you might be able to go to human resources. Um, you could you could keep this instructional design gig going for a long time probably if you play your cards right and you're strategic about it. But you know you also have the opportunity to learn about a lot of other things, and that's always my advice. You know if you get into a situation where you know you're for example, in a medium-sized business where, like in Ally's company, they're growing and they, they're having these pains, right? And they still think they're small. There's room for innovation, right? So if you are in that position and you can drive the bus, do it all day long. That's, that is always my recommendation. That's, you know, if you can open your own door and, and see the future a little bit, you got to go in that direction. Just, just my perspective. How's that, Greg? <laughs> no, I, I, that kind of, you know, I think concurs with, with what I think, but I think some people, they just think that I can do this job and I can do it forever, which they can, but their yeah. opportunities are going to be limited, at least in, in my opinion. Beth, I agree. Um, one thing I will say, um, and you and I have had this conversation before, and I don't mind sharing this insight with anybody, good instructional designers are hard to find. They really are. And if somebody has a passion and a skill for it, and that's pretty much entirely what they want to do with their career, one of the best places to be is in consulting. It's, you know, in ongoing sort of contracts. Um, I have a very dear friend who, um, that, is, that is her gig. She doesn't want to work for a company. She wants to keep learning about a lot of different things. And she's an amazing designer, and she's very, um, very accomplished. Uh, but the, the niche for her was consulting, and um, you know, your reputation gets around when you're when you're good. So that's just one one thing to think about. If that's the passion, think about that kind of arena. There's pain and agony involved in sort of getting yourself established there, no doubt about it. Um, but if that's kind of where you want to be long term. It's a good place to be. Or um, sometimes sort of. Public sector jobs can can uh, be pretty satisfying in that regard as well. All right. Okay. Hey, Bridget. Allie here. I have another uh, uh, th an observation. I I've, in the education world. I mean, in, in in ISD, I've been more limited in my experience, but I've been in business for a long time in a lot of different roles. Sure. So one of the things that I've noticed in my experience, like in the smaller and mid-sized organizations. Trainers and people in the training department are heroes a lot of the time. They're stars, and they're they they're the ones that people go to to get something done. They're able to make things happen. Right. They're very popular people. But right. when when you get into the larger organization, that kind of disappears. And and in fact, I've noticed in really large organizations that you actually have to make noise as trainers in the training department education to make sure they include training early enough in their projects so that right. you can actually do what you need to do. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, it's interesting. You know, for, for bigger organizations, they start to really think about distance in a different way and sort of being able to repurpose training and, and so forth. And somehow trainers start to really get left out, you know. And it's, it's unfortunate in a lot of regards because there are – there are lots still to this day, in my opinion, a lot of um, types of content that really still have, I think the classroom might still be the very best place to teach them, you know, or, or a virtual classroom. So you're, you're right. I have seen that over and over again. I've also seen in larger organizations that are very focused on service. So Marriott's a perfect example. Um, amazing, amazing organization, um, but very, it's, it's about property people, right, and providing this amazing experience. So a lot of the value is on personal interactions. So in an organization like that, oftentimes these really amazing designs and incredible deliverables 
um, got no credit or mention at all. It was all about the people that delivered them. So I think sometimes, you know, what, what an organization values can change that scenario too. Any great, great feedback. Any, any other thoughts, guys? Okay. Well, I'm going to move on to sort of the last slide here for this section. So we'll just talk. Um, I'll try and move through this pretty quickly in terms of um, uh, the pros and cons for folks um, in an international or national organization. So training managers, again, much like in a large organization, you have very strategic responsibilities. You're usually directly aligned with key business leaders. Um, your goals tend to be very specific. Performance is, is pretty narrowly defined. This is a great thing if you're a training manager. It allows you to be nimble and to focus your team. In terms of cons, um, pretty much the same as we saw last, last go around, right? So you can often be competing for dollars and for resources. Um, meeting the needs of internal and external customers and sometimes dealing with international deliverables, that can be a bit of a challenge for a training manager. For instructional designers, um, here again, your work assignments, you tend to be hitting every level of the ADI model. You have exposure to very sophisticated technologies. Um, you get exposed to tons of design professionals and business line specific folks. A lot of exposure to international peers. Um, and that can be great. I've had some really um, wonderful experiences getting to know folks in the European Union, um, getting to know folks in India, Latin America. Um, they have very different challenges from design and delivery perspectives, and that can be invaluable. Another con, um, we saw this before, but you can get pigeonholed as an instructional designer for a big organization like that based on a business line. So you might be pigeonholed as a sales instructional designer um, or, you know, possibly a um, IT designer. This happens, I think, guys, a lot of times just out of convenience of thinking for executives. They tend to sort of categorize resources um, just because it's easier. And it does, if, if you're somebody who wants to diversify as an instructional designer, the effort is a little harder, I think, in these types of organizations. You have to do a heck of a lot of work in terms of uh, relationship building, in terms of, you know, getting, getting your name sort of out there, if you will. Um, so a little bit, little bit of a challenge there. For developers, pros, um, access, to, again, to advanced technologies, lots of, of room to learn new things, to grow, to refine your skills, lots of opportunity for innovation and exposure um, to repurposing work for international audiences. Um, this can also be a really invaluable experience. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have been involved in translation projects, um, but you know, it's kind of like your, your first date, you'll never forget it the first time you do it. So this can be a great situation for developers that want to really um, become sort of those, those large international, national um, players for a long time. Um, in terms of cons, as we saw with the other organizations, developers can turn into the go-to media person for multiple teams. Um, there's a potential lack of understanding about needs for new equipment in this type of environment, for new software, for international training readiness, which is very different. Um, so that can be, uh, that can take up a lot of time for developers in terms of educating management and leadership as to why those things are necessary. For trainers, um, you do still have visibility. You do still have organizational value, opportunity for collaborative work with other business lines, exposure to new technologies. Um, in this environment, though, you do, trainers tend to be pigeonholed. They tend to be pigeonholed to a business line. Um, there's oftentimes, if they're being sent around the world, there's high burnout potential for, for trainers. Um, and then, as Ali mentioned, there's that, that possibility of not really being recognized in quite the same way. Um, a lot of times these organizations have to be digital. They're, they're operating in a virtual space because of their structure. And so sometimes the people element gets sort of lost, and that includes for trainers in classroom training. For project managers, um, this can be an amazing environment. Um, 
here again, highly complex projects, deliverables. You get to work with um, all kinds of training and development practices. You start to adjust theory. Um, you're highly visible in the organization, and oftentimes you have budget responsibilities, very much like we saw with large organization. Um, here again, you do have you run the risk of pile on. Um, the work can be challenging for managers who aren't used to the detail again of what instruction design um, involves. There's also this whole new aspect for these big, big, big organizations of technical requirements um, that go along very specifically with managing international training and development. And a lot of times for project managers, they don't. It, it, it is new to them in terms of why there's a new wrinkle in their process, why you have new folks on the team, why you're adding milestones, etc. It, it can just be a little bit of a challenge. Bridget? In yes, Greg. Um, I think uh, Bill Banks has a question. Yes, Bill. Actually, it was just um, going on what Ali said earlier, because uh, I work for a very, very large financial firm. We have probably about 50,000 employees. Okay. And our training department is scattered through about four different countries, and we have approximately 90 plus uh, people in our training department. Wow. And one of the things that struck me what she said is that when there are um, training initiatives or major projects that have to be done, sometimes the training department sometimes is not brought into it at the onset. Right. And it's just because it's such a large company that sometimes people don't think about us. For right. example, I'm working on a project that they didn't bring us in until seven months into it. Right. And it took right. the president from New York saying, where's training? Right. And yeah. everybody around at each other kind of dumped down and, oh, Christ, we forgot to add training to our distribution list. Right, right. That's a that's a great point, Bill. And I'm sorry, Ali, you did say that. I did not address it, but very. Um, this is this is a huge problem with these bigger organizations. I'm I've got an effort going on with the entire enterprise um, for a public sector group. Um, I'll just tell you that <laughs> the entire enterprise decided that they were going to change over to. Um, the Microsoft Communications platform and didn't bring any of the training organizations into the, the, the know about this at all until sort of last month. The goal is to start rolling out and going live by September. We have virtual training sessions that are built on a Lotus Notes platform. So not only do we have sort of this rush to develop training for the new platform, but we also have to transition and redesign our own training for this new platform. So that's just one one example of how training is sort of left out. And again, um, you know, Bill, you spoke to it, Ali, I think you did too. I mean, because these organizations are so big, they don't always connect the dots about what people need to know, and training becomes an afterthought. And it's funny, I'm looking at your um your table here, and you have it broken out based off individual responsibilities, but currently, I'm wearing the hat of the instructional designer, the developer, the trainer, I'm the project manager, right. and also the coordinator. Right, right. And yeah, and, and this is, um, that's something that um, I should have given you guys the caveat at the beginning. There are lots of organizations that do try to make, you know, try to have very functional training organizations where where somebody does everything. Um, that that just happens over and over and over again. And there are lots of organizations that do have these very specific roles laid out. I think Greg mentioned this, but you might also take on um, if you're an instructional designer, you might find yourself implementing training somewhere. This it, it does happen. This, I kind of organized it this way just so we could sort of talk about what this means in terms of role, structure, and function. So I think the last sort of little piece on this uh, slide was coordinators. Um, it's basically the same as we saw in a large organization. You do have room, room to grow. You have a lot of exposure to what performance demands of an organization are. 
lots of opportunities to learn new technologies. You can engage in event planning. But here, once again, there tends to be a lot of work and it tends to be very administrative in nature. Um, you don't have quite the same runway. Okay. And so that's um, pretty much the bulk of my presentation in terms of structures. There are two other little pieces that I want to touch on, and I'll let you guys to decide um, you know, if you want to talk about them any further. Um, but I wanted to touch kind of high level on nonprofits, nonprofits in the public sector. Um, just to, to say a couple quick things. Uh, we could probably do another couple hours on these two alone. <laughs> so in terms of nonprofits, um, they tend to resemble small and medium-sized organizations when it comes to training team function, structure. Um, in terms of the biggest challenge for them, it often tends to be raising funds to grow and improve. And public sector training organization, I'm talking about, um, just to remind you guys, state, federal organizations, large academic organizations, um, they tend to resemble large and international and national organizations um, and businesses. Uh, they tend to be structured very similarly. There tends to be, you know, in public sector organizations, um, lots of different training organizations. Part of their biggest challenge, and I'm talking very specifically about federal and state government here, is combating scope creep and direction loss due to delegated authority. And what I mean there, um, for public sector organizations, you don't have the same sort of executive structure. Um, very, very different than private organizations. Um, keeping these organizations going in one direction uh, is a challenge, and I think a lot of training providers that service these organizations have to reorganize their work processes around that delegated authority. So I wanted to keep discussion there brief and you know I, I think that we can talk more about that if, if you're interested. Um, but that's pretty much everything that I have for you. I feel like I I opened sort of a fire hose off in you. So I think at this point, um, I don't know, do you guys need a little break? Um, take... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Rolanda. Um, I actually had a question about um, earlier when you first, I had a difficulty speaking, but when you first started speaking about the um, larger organizations and instructional designers, mm -hmm. and I um, actually put a comment in the chat box um, comment and I have a question. I am, I guess what you would consider a junior ISD in a larger organization and you mentioned that one of the cons was that um, I guess your uh, skill set would never be, you know, it's difficult to get to recognize with so much going on. Um, what I'm experiencing right now is not being able to, uh, I guess, stay on a project long enough to find my niche and figure out what my area is as an instructional designer. Right, right, right. Because so, it's so large and it's just like, you know, projects are just rolling in and it's, well, you go here, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I may not be on a project long enough because this is all new for me to, you know, say, well, I guess I do really like evaluations, but oh, no, wait, I do like to do this and do that, so. Got it. So what, do you find that you're being sort of piecemeal tasks of bigger projects, like a storyboard here or the measurement there and not soup to nuts. Right, right. Right. And so I even talked to my career manager about it once before, but I just wanted to know like what would you suggest? Like how can I still in some way find out, you know, what my area should be or what I like to focus on the most when it comes to instructional design? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, I have done so many, so many different types of jobs <laughs> in this industry, and I, I have like definitely a passion for media development. I can tell you my fav my very, very favorite thing to do in all of the ID world is storyboards. I love storyboards. <laughs> That's um one of one of my absolute favorites. Is it what I'm best at? I have been told over and over again that I'm a fantastic. Classroom designer. 
So um, I've been told I'm very good at, at uh, e-learning and, and boarding and that type of thing too. But that's what I love to do, and I don't think I'd know that if I just weren't given opportunities to do it. So for you, if you're not getting those opportunities at work, um, what I would say is, you know, if you're and you're in a large organization, right? Yes. I would try to reach out to some peers in sort of other organizations with our training units within the organization just to, to have some community, right? Find out what they're doing, et cetera, and try to figure out what their, their processes are, et cetera. So kind of try to get a flavor there for what other folks in the organization are doing. Um, that allows you to sort of open the door a lot into a conversation with your own team. Hey, did you know that in this organization they're doing blah, blah? So I think the more knowledgeable you become, the more trustworthy, or I shouldn't say trustworthy, but the more of an expert you start to be seen as, and the more assignments that sort of come your way, because you're a person that sort of connects the dots. Now, that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. I've been there, too. And when I want to um, learn more, I reach outside of my organization. I think you're doing an amazing thing by being at UMBC because that's definitely going to push you to do, you know, work that you're probably not familiar with. Um, and then there's sort of external communities of practice. I am not the person that will ever tell you to do any work for free because I, I don't believe in that. <laughs> and in fact, when, when the recession hit, I was like banging my head when they were telling people the Washington Post to volunteer for work. That was just ridiculous. Um, but I think that you can, in our discipline, there are lots and lots of opportunities for contracting work. Um, so I'd start looking out, too, and see what else might be. If you've got the bandwidth, and, you know, outside of work, take a look. And you can bring that sort of back to the workplace as well. I okay, hope thank you. Is it helpful, I hope? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I will do you just um networking to my list, a little bit more networking. Yeah, yeah, and definitely um, try to reach out to people internally, you know, even if it's just a friendly, hey, you know, you want to grab a coffee, I'd really love to learn a little more about what your organization is doing. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I am very sorry I didn't see your question. I, I, I'm horrible at this. <laughs> Let me give it a chat. I apologize. Okay. So, Q&A, I am leaving this up to you guys. How are you feeling? Are you, are you burnt out? <laughs> Is there, what, what, I was just going to leave this open to you guys. <laughs> Would you like to take a break? Do you want to, do you have questions? Are you done? Come on, guys. I know you have questions. Are you wondering how I got all that experience in my life when I'm only 28 years old? <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> this is Allie again. Uh, um, one of the things that I found interesting, like at, at my business, like when um, when people are not try not uh, open to what training is needing to do or that there was a need for certain types of things to happen. I found that if I can phrase it in the language and terms that they understand. So I work for a healthcare organization. So right. if I can if I can present the training stuff in terms of, you know, what would happen with a patient. Right. Um, somehow they get it. You know, it just they're they're hearing the same information but like two minutes ago, they were adamantly opposed to something, and all of a sudden, you phrase it differently, talking in a language that they understand, and yeah. suddenly they're open to it. So it just was a, an insight for me to realize, to learn, to try to talk the language of the people that I'm talking to. Like that was a, like an aha moment for me, which I kind of enjoyed. Yeah, you're a smart lady, Ellie. <laughs> it, it can sometimes take a while to get there, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you, you have to know your audience, right? If you want to drive something strategically, you have to make it pertinent to them. So you, you're right on the money. 
it's also in saying that we also have to teach the line of business how to use or why we use a needs analysis. Right. We are slowly shaping our management team to understand before we are going to go ahead and create a training program, we need to get to the root of what the issue is. Right. Because in some cases we've come across where the problem is not because of lack of training or they need additional instruction. It's just that the atmosphere in which people are working in is just not pleasant. Right. And that's something that's beyond our scope. And we also are starting to have them getting used to charters. And we want them to sign off on anything to cover our rear end if anything comes up at a later date saying that this is what you promised and we can say no, that's not what we originally agreed upon. If that's something you want to have done, well, that's going to change the entire scope of what was originally set in place. Right. So they're right. starting to understand that there's a lot of paperwork that we expect them to complete at the initial part of offering any type of training. Right. Yeah, I, and you're going in the exact right direction. I mean, you definitely want to have agreement up front about what the scope of a project is. You, you, you want folks to understand the impact of changing the scope. And, you know, something else that I might throw into your mix, if it makes sense, um, a real fast way to get the attention of folks who want to change scope is to talk about dollars. And dollars um, that will be coming down the road or dollars that will be burned because of change in direction or scope. Um, that's often, you know, something that you can lay out right up front as well. You know, I work in the public sector at the moment. Um, I had a colleague who said, you know, how do you, how do you get these people to stop talking about the code and to start delivering, etc." And my advice right there was talk about the dollars because that's something kind of universally <laughs> across organization types um, that's, that's uh, an attention getter and, and causes folks to think twice about changing course. Well, we have actually done that. For example, this project I'm working on, we were adamant that if we're going to have to have any um, traveling, whether it be to New York City or to Boston, it was going to have to come out of the project budget as opposed to the train department budget. Yeah. Um, it just, even though we're a large company, our train budget has been cut every year for the last three or four years, obviously because of the economy. Sure. And we just can't take that kind of hit flying back and forth from, say, Baltimore to Boston. That has to be agreed upon if there's some type of class that was originally played to be e-learning and all of a sudden they decide they have to have a classroom setting, well, that's going to incur cost of flight, the hotel, the food. Um, so everything has to be revisited. So I think in some ways they're getting annoyed with us, but it needs to be brought out, and they have to understand they have to work with training, yeah. and we're just not a supplement to whatever they need resolved. Right, and I think, you know, a lot of what you're getting at there goes back to sort of project governance and sort of laying out the, the sort of the, the working, the rubric for a project up front. So it's amazing to me how many times you can, you can do that and do a really great job of that, just, you know, putting all your cards on the table. You know, if we've got to travel, it increases the budget. If we're going to make this change, it increases the budget. If, if you ask an external resource to do X, Y, and Z, it's going to burn dollars, etc. You can be really, really explicit, and a lot of times your internal customers are still going to come back to you with, I think we should have a face-to-face -face meeting. I think that would be much more effective, etc. So, you know, that that can be a challenge. And generally, what you often have to do is, again, remind them, okay, so when we started this project, we were all on the same page. And just to, you know, think this through, remember, I said it was going to cost out, you know, whatever it might be. A lot of times you do have to, to bring folks back. So I think really making sure that everybody's on the same page up front is, is key. But, you know, in your situation, Bill, where they're kind of seeing training as a little bit of an inconvenience um, here and there, I mean, that happens too, you know, just because folks that are involved in training development tend to have a day job as well. So I think, you know, a lot of times you need to do a bunch of relationship building along the way when we're working on a project. So I don't, I don't know if that helps or not. But 
I would say level setting, project governance, onboard relationship building tends to sort of help in those situations. Well, I can say for the fact we have an overall project manager that's actually based in Manhattan, and he had just come on to the project about maybe about three months ago. Right. And he came up with the idea of having everybody from the United States gather to Delaware for a two-day seminar, and it gave them an opportunity to see where we're coming from training. Right. And I think it alleviated some of the concerns that people had because right. there was a little bit of a lack of communication or miscommunication going on. Right. So by having all the business partners and also the directors in one room for two, um, two days really benefited that. And it's you work for a large company and you have a project that's going to be relatively immense, that's something I would strongly suggest is have training involved, voicing their concerns if there's anything that they want to have roll out that's just not feasible, especially if you don't have the headcount to develop right. something that's so immense. Right. Yeah, so your project manager did a roadshow. That, that is always very smart. <laughs> and that, that goes a long way in building those relationships too, yeah. Um, this is Allie again. I, I was going to say um, to Rolanda when she was talking about how do you find out what you like to do, right. um, when she was asking that question, in, in my organization a couple years ago, I found out by accident that there were other instructional designers and that, there, I mean, it was just a shock to me that I had no idea within the organization that we had other people that were doing some of the things that I was doing, like there was mm -hmm. repetition of skills and anyway, so I, I developed, I created a, um, a group, a, a, a volunteer, we, were, we call it the Learning Development Forum, and we still, we meet once a month, and we rotate who's going to present, and we share information, we demonstrate things we've been doing and using tools we created, or uh, learning, e-learning things we've done, or video conferencing, how to do webinars, all kinds of stuff like that, and it ends up being, um, we teach each other a lot, and um, it, it helps you get some clarity. I don't know if she's in a position to be able to make a, you know, a volunteer group over there that people could share information and show things that they're working on. It's really kind of, it's nice camaraderie, but it's also a way to see what there is. Sure, sure. You know, and having, having those communities of practice within our organization is invaluable, right? And, um, you know, I do, one great thing about being in graduate school, you've got sort of this built-in community of practice, but in the workplace, if, if you can meet on a regular basis with folks and share things like, you know, hey, I just developed this, this template for web-based web training. I just developed this storyboard template. I just made this really cool flash calculator. You know, whatever it might be, that's, that's, um, that's not only great for you in terms of resources, but again, Ali, as you're saying, it opens your eyes to what else you could be doing from a work perspective where else you might be working in the organization. So I, I agree. I think if, if you're in a place where you can start a community of practice, go for it. This is Greg. Um, the other thing re related to that, Bridget, is I, I think that you know, a lot of us work in organizations that even though they're maybe a a decent size, there are not a lot of um, colleagues that do our sort of work. So I think it's really important for people to, um, you know, really create and sustain their own professional network and get feedback on the work that they do because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, chances are there might not be anyone in your organization that really is qualified in some cases to give you feedback on some of your work. So I think it's really important for people to kind of look outside that to get that feedback. Right, right, I agree. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of the reasons I like to present, you know, at UMBC or, you know, I occasionally um, teach at a couple community colleges, I like to keep meeting people in, in the profession as well. Um, I learn all the time. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really imperative. There's a, a, a saying in the imaging and digital arts world, which is rev up or perish. So basically, you know, either move on to the next version of something or you're going to get run over. 
And I think in our discipline, it's network or parish. I mean, you really kind of need to, to keep in touch with folks and, you know, keep, keep um, building those relationships. Or you can get kind of um, pigeonholed a little bit. Or you can get left behind. So it's very, very important. You're right, and I think the exciting thing are there. If people are willing to be flexible and adapt and try new things, there are a lot of opportunities, really. But they, you know, people have to be open-minded to, you know, be willing to look foolish sometimes once in a while, even yeah. if it's in your own, even if it's in your own living room, when you yeah. try to do something new or, or you know, explore something different than you have in the past. Absolutely. And, you know, in this day and age, there's so many different menus for learning about opportunities. I mean, it's, it's we're in a really good place. And I will say that, I, I mean, I feel like the world of training development and instructional design in particular, it's just really becoming more and more and more valuable and strategic. It's just a, we're, we're all in a good place. Okay, and that, that snoring noise is the little dog sitting on my lap. Everybody, that's not me. <laughs> now, there are some people we haven't heard from tonight. How about hearing from Maureen, Sherry, Candace? I don't think we've heard from any of you folks. They're all on mute. You guys have nothing to say, or how about we hear from you? We haven't heard a word. This is Sherry, but I think your presentation was great. I just I don't really have any questions for you right now. So. Totally fair. Totally fair. Like I said, I think it was like a big fire hose of information. I think Ali chatted in that LinkedIn has instructional designer forums. Yeah, they, yes. I think they probably have uh, numerous ones related to instructional design. They actually do, and of course, like the e-learning guild is on there. You can get on the, the forums for specific um, instructional design courses. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do is get Yeah, absolutely. That LinkedIn is a great, great way to meet folks. Great way to get jobs, too. Any other comments or questions for Bridget? Okay, so do I assume that this, okay, let's see. Bill Banks is chatting in a question, Bridget, if you can. How would you classify the military, probably the largest training organization in the United States? I think, um, I think I he means it, in your structure that you went through. I would call it public sector. I would definitely call it public sector. And, or, you know, the military also could be a structure in and of itself. <laughs> They are wildly complex. That is absolutely correct. The reason why I bring them up, I think they're a great example to touch on because not only do they train their staff internally, but they do such a great job of allowing their, um, to say the troops, an opportunity to take classes online. There are numerous stories of uh, people that are in Afghanistan or Iraq, that even though they're out there fighting for us, they're still taking the time to actually get a degree in some subject, and I just think that's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, they're definitely, the military from a training perspective and a development perspective, very unique, lots, lots of levels. Um, you know, I mean, just think about sort of the, um, the the structure behind moving people up in rank, et cetera. There's a lot of discipline there, um, and there's a lot of 
funding, you know, federal funding for helping people improve. So um, they, they are amazing. I, I have to agree with you there. It's very, you know, oftentimes though, lots and lots of hard work. Um, I think I, I see professional development as one of the major, major, major benefits of that career, considering um, a lot of the hard work that kind of goes in on the front end. And I think that correlates to the uh, private sector, too, because when I left college, I worked for three of the largest financial institutions, State Street in Boston, PNC Bank, that's based in Pittsburgh, and now Bank of New York Mellon. Right. And all the people that hold some type of leader position served in the military, whether it was in the Marines or the Army. Right. So it does right. translate very well from a military career into the private sector. Yeah, so they bring yeah. The it's, it's the discipline, right? I mean, and, and sort of systematic approach to doing certain types of work, I think. Great, you can very have a, organized. They can deal with people of certain stature very well. Right, right, right. And that's, that's another key aspect of, of that, um, of, of the military, is sort of communication, understanding, organization, you know, definitely, definitely a benefit. And I was going to say, Greg, you could do an entire session on military training. <laughs> yeah, one, one nice thing about the military is um, there's a fair amount of good information out there. It's public domain, and by that I mean anybody can use it because it was created with tax dollars. So all the different services out there, the armed services, have their version of like a train-the-trainer. And if you search for it online, you can find all these documents and course design plans and so forth that are available for you to lose, use because they were used with taxpayer do dollars. And they often say right on the front cover that you know this document may be used freely since it was produced by taxpayer money. So it's, it's a good source of information if, if you're looking for anything like that. Yeah, and I will say that my uh, my military clients and Homeland Security clients, um, when I've done sort of any kind of instructor manual, participant manual, they are very, very specific about components of those manuals, too. So, um, I mean, there's just a lot of discipline and rigor happening there, and it's, it's great to be able to do that kind of work as an instructional designer, too. You pick up some amazingly good habits, no doubt. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, I will um, just move on to my very last slide, which was to thank you again for um, letting me present this evening. I, I said it before, I'll say it again. This is always um, a, a pleasure for me and a privilege for me to be able to kind of connect again with you and see I'm grateful for Greg for keeping me on the list. And um, I've got my email address there. I'm sure that Greg will um, be happy to give it to you as well. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I try to be as generous as possible with my time and resources. So if you uh, have any follow-up questions or you know thoughts about resources, whatever, feel very, very free to drop me a line. OK. Well, let me take this opportunity, Bridget, to uh, thank you for sharing your time tonight and preparing for the presentation and, and so forth. And it's it's always good, you know, to hear different perspectives. Um, and I, I think that's really important. In fact, you know, big, one of the big reasons I like to have guest speakers is, you know, you've done things that I have not, and you've done them in places that I have not. So uh, I, I really think it's important for, for people to hear different perspectives and not just um, one person. So thank you very much, Bridget. We really appreciate My it. Pleasure. Thanks again. All right. Anybody have any questions? I am busy looking at your assignments you just sent in a few days back. Um, I just moved offices. I'm in like the third day in my new office and um, it's been a little chaotic. Uh, just getting phone and um, computer internet access, so uh, please bear with me. 
But anybody have any questions, comments? I really like the way she did the table because the part where she indicated about the very large company is pretty much exact where I work. She hit it on the head. Okay. Well, good. That's because she has great experience. Like I said, she's been independent consultant. Uh, work has worked for the federal government. Has worked for small, you know, small business, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Um, so she, yeah, she's she's really seen a variety of different organizations, which um, everybody doesn't always have that. Some some people don't want to have that, but you know, one of Bridget's I think motivating factors is she enjoys learning new things and new challenges. So we were fortunate to have her uh, with us this evening. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, if not, I hope people um, are in a cool place. Um, I'm, ass I'm assuming you have some sort of electricity if you're if you're with us here here in Maryland. Uh, a lot of people still don't have uh, power. So uh, thanks again, and we'll see you online, folks. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night.